We're very lucky today to have a leading thinker on the Chinese economy with us, uh, Kei Yu Jin from the London School of Economics. Um, I'm going to leave the introduction of um, Professor Jin uh, for a moment and say that we're also so very lucky today to have David Yang, a professor in the Department of Economics and director of the Center for History and Economics, to introduce Professor Jin and engage her in dialogue. Professor Yang is a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a global scholar at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and a fellow at BREAD, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to encourage research and scholarship in development economics. David's research focuses on political economy, in particular the forces of stability and forces of change in authoritarian regimes, drawing lessons from historical and contemporary China. So over to you, Professor Yang. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kerry Kerryjin, who designates uh, much interaction to this crowd. Uh, Kerry is a professor of economics at London School of Economics. She received her uh, undergrad, master, and, and patient degree in economics uh, at, all at Harvard University. Uh, she is a, a, a foremost expert in international finance and sectional economics, and also a, an expert on Chinese economy. She's going to tell us about her new book, The New China Playbook. Uh, she has been working extensively with the, the World Bank, IMF, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the Davos Forum, and so on, just to think about how the world engages China and how China engages the world. So the format for today, uh, Kyo is going to talk, talk, talk to us for 30 minutes or so about her new book. Uh, we'll have a few comments uh, and then open up the questions to, uh, to the panel. Okay, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, let me say it's an enormous honor and privilege to be here, to be back at Harvard. I spent nine years here, so it's uh, familiar territory. But um, you know, when today I'm talking about Chinese issues, to be greeted by a very authentic cup of green tea from China uh, tells me that I'm exactly in the right place uh, to talk about this. So my talk, about, my talk today is going to focus on the Chinese era. It's not solely about my book. There will be elements borrowed from there. Um, because it's fair to say that there is a new era for the Chinese economy. Uh, but the question is, and I don't have a definite answer, but I'd love to you know, hear from interactions with you, whether the very unique model that it has fostered, really quite unprecedented in the world, and the old playbook is actually suited for China to meet its new challenges and actually its huge economic potential in the coming years whether that model will still be uh, very, um, will actually you know, work effectively. Uh, in the headline news and Western media, often the discussions around the Chinese economy all, almost often treats it almost as if it's an advanced economy and subject to the predicaments of uh, a mature economy. But while some places in China has reached income levels of Saudi Arabia or even South Korea, and certainly with housing prices as high as San Francisco and even as Boston as early as a decade ago, um, we can't forget that there's still almost a billion people, 900 million people, who are living under $300 uh, a month. And that billion people ascendance, you know, which would be so critical, not only for China itself, but for the rest of the world is something we need to ponder about uh, you know, where it is today and where it's going in the, in, the, in the next few years. And I still argue that that will be the key national priority, despite the backdrop of geopolitics and uh, competition and uh, all other kinds of uh, 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 issues. I think that is still going to be the focus of the leadership and the national uh, priority going forward. So first of all, let me describe what that model is. I think there's uh, it's, it's often not well understood, sometimes less uh, appreciated. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the book, in my book, I, I talked about this high growth and high cost model. Um, yes, we've seen this amazing economic performance, whether it's GDP, uh, uh, poverty alleviation, or even the success of its technology companies, but what's the cost behind it? But on the other hand, uh, it's very difficult to argue the counterfactual without this model, without the cost, where China would be today. So I think on balance, even if there are significant challenges to the political economy model, uh, and we're seeing some of that being revealed and manifested uh, uh, right now, I think on balance, it's been regarded as a success, at least until now. Um, so 
Chinese technological prowess is one of a very unique, uh, a very uh, special feature of a developing country for I, for which I think the first time in in history has uh, is able to do cutting edge technology. Uh, here is just a you know a, a description of the unicorn companies uh, uh, that's coming from China. Uh, 245 unicorn companies um, out of a thousand, uh, a little more than a thousand uh, uh, in the world, and just behind uh, the U.S. Uh, in that in that tally, and the number of super unicorn companies valued at over 10 billion dollars or more, really it's you know split between China and the U.S. So one of the very special features is that a developing country can do uh, technology. But what is also interesting is how decentralized the distribution of these unicorn companies are uh, in China. Uh, they're basically spread all over uh, places that, you know, basically that have a, a solid uh, economy, uh, with the exception of the western and central provinces. But it's not just in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, a few cities. It's not just one major Silicon Valley, uh, as you know, we have uh, in the U.S., uh, and not just maybe two or three tech hubs, but they're really all, uh, all around uh, the, the country. Uh, if you just look at EVs, and of course EVs, China has become the largest producer and consumer of EVs within 10 years. There are hundreds of EV companies uh, spread all over China. And they're actually backed by different city-level governments. So, for instance, NIO, a top-leading uh, EV, is backed by the Hefei government, Xiaopeng by the Guangzhou government, uh, Baoding has Great Wall, uh, Changcheng, and whether it's Fuzhou, Hainan, Nan Nanchang, or Chongqing, they all have their own uh, uh, EVs. And same thing with chips. Uh, in the province of Jiangsu, where David is originally from, you know, whether it's Wuxi, Nanjing, or, uh, or Suzhou, uh, well, in the, even in the semiconductor space, uh, different local governments are focusing on uh, fostering uh, different elements, uh, segments of that of that industry. So it's very geographically spread. And if we look at uh, this, is the number of local government guided funds uh, as of 2022? There were 15. Hundred and amounting to 27.2 trillion RMB, and again, you know, whether you look at the Northeast, not particularly developed places in China, um, or, or um, of course, South China, you know, there there are many. So it's not just focused on a few cities, but there's really, really spread over around uh, geographically dispersed. And uh, let me just, just, just take one case study. Uh, this is solar panels. I'm taking this case study because there's actually real academic work on, done on this. This is done by um, some of my colleagues at the London School of Economics. Uh, basically, first telling you that, uh, well, you know, the solar, um, the cost of solar, a global average cost of solar energy is only really about a tenth of what it was uh, 20 years ago. And, uh, and that global revolution uh, let's see, was, this is a global revolution, was basically led by China. And um, this is the share of um, annual uh, solar uh, cell production. And this is China. And then what you see is that it basically started in the mid-2000s. Uh, and not only is it just about production, but it's also about innovation. The site weighted, uh, the so patents, uh, Chinese solar patents also started to rise very sharply from 2005. And so guess what happened uh, in 2005? There were policies that were implemented to, you know, basic industrial policy for solar manufacturing, but they were primarily financed, uh, developed, and allocated by local government bureaucrats, right? So it was a local government that enacted all these reforms. And by the way, the timing and arrival of these policies and the extent of these policies were different uh, across different cities, which you can use as identification <coughs> to test some of the causal effects of these uh, policies on, uh, uh, on, on solar. And they found that these policies significantly raised not only solar production, revenue, innovation, and also exports, and also the number of firms. And these kind of incentives really vary widely, whether it's taxes or cheap land, or helping them coordinate financing from uh, a park, uh, sorry, from, from banks, local uh, banks, or solar industrial parks, et cetera, um, were, were, uh, were, were what was offered, very much like the other kind of industrial policies. But again, it's at the decentralized level. Now, one of the things that we think about China 
Oh, and, and let me just uh, show you. And this is the patent distribution at the SETI level. This was the beginning of 2005. And just look at what happened in 2019, uh, the, the extent of the number of solar panel uh, 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 um, patents. And again, they're spread all over China, not just in a few uh, centralized uh, localities or big cities. They're really everywhere. So. This is, I think, a very good example uh, to showcase how these kind of local government decentralized model works in China. And in the beginning, it was reforms in the 1980s. They were the one that pushed through the reforms. But then eventually, it was about you know, GDP, and then it was environmental protection. Now it's technology. It was solar. And a lot of it is utilizing that, that decentralized model. So this is just to show that uh, once an industry that was just totally dominated by the US um, at the technological frontier uh, has now over time shifted uh, uh, over at least uh, to China and other countries, but China in particular. Um, so uh, in my book, I talk about the mayor economy. Of course, it's funnier in Chinese because shi zhang jingji and shi chang jingji sounds more similar. But mayor economy, market economy is also, um, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's also a parallel. And the basic, uh, you know, summary of this model, I'm sure people are familiar with this, but uh, there is a political centralization at the very top, but there's an extreme form of economic decentralization, and that's local governments plus companies, and they would do things like you know promote GDP or innovation or environment stability, wh whatever that 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 objective is. And one key uh, tool that the central government holds over the local governments is basically the ability to, you know, it's personnel control. So ability to, to promote them or demote them. And the local governments were hugely incentivized to um, foster a very uh, competitive and thriving local economy so that they could raise the chances of being promoted. Uh, again, that might be familiar to this crowd, but uh, less so uh, to, to, to the uh, um, to others, and that was one of the key incentives. And then, of course, uh, yardstick competition, you needed to have the local governments compete, and that restrained some of their uh, uh, misbehavior, or that was at least the thinking. So there's some uh, competition mechanisms all, also at place. Um, so I think um, one of the, the things that we underestimate, or you know, when people ask me uh, what is really different about the Chinese economy, what can, what can we learn from it, even if we can't replicate the model, is I think we do need to think about the role of the state. Uh, and uh, you know, from our earlier discussions, we also mentioned this today, I think about Americans uh, uh, putting out the, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Big Chip Act, and, and all these industrial policies, and Jake Sullivan's re recent uh, speech about America, renewing American leadership, it all sounds kind of like China again. So I think um, that, that reassessing that role of the state is, is somewhat important, but we have to be very nuanced about it. Um, when it is new, used, what kind of state power is, is important at what stages of development. Um, so uh, China's state power lies in the resources that, it's, uh, that it owns and also its ability to, to mobilize uh, around key projects. For instance, right now there is a national program to undertake science and technology, whole of a nation program, and the ability to mobilize resources, almost like wartime resources, is something that is also quite, um, it demonstrates its power. And of course, also allocation of resources. And it's not just the allocation of resources, but also the ability to allocate, allocate losses to certain groups of people, interest groups, and uh, sectors. That is something that is very difficult um, for other governments uh, with more political constraints to undertake. But if we review the last 40 years, um, there were definitely lots of groups that were not just winners, but uh, they were actually losers. And imposition of that on certain groups of people was also political flexibility that helped them uh, 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 enact kind of system level changes. Another um, a uh, feature of that uh, political economy, I think, that, that really actually explains some of this very paradoxical, uh, often very paradoxical economic phenomenon in China, is the tools. Is It's the scale, the degree, the vastness, and the number of tools that the Chinese government can use to do mass intervention. Um, and this is legislative, administrative, financial, personnel, but it really goes into, you know, think about the financial industry, uh, the ability to uh, impose, you know, uh, 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 stamp duties, uh, uh, you know, without almost um, 
uh, or, or these kind of uh, various uh, financial, you know, capital controls at any time and point. Um, and uh, that's, that's quite difficult. Sometimes you can say that that is actually one of the reasons why China did not see a major financial crisis. The ability to, uh, to, to uh, kind of utilize a lot of these tools to stimulate or to stop you know, housing prices from falling, which is what we're seeing today, or even you know, stemming housing prices from rising too quickly, uh, if that were the interest. Um, but also, really, it covers administrative power. You know, there's a recent reduction, 50%, apparently 50% reduction in the number of administrative or approval-based systems um, uh, uh, that, that's happened at the local government front. But just approval-based, you know, the stock market, the approval-based system, and all of that has created a lot of very uh, uh, puzzling and potentially inefficient uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, uh, economic patterns in China. But it's also helped China to prevent some of these major crises because, again, um, stemming a crisis of confidence is something that the Chinese government can do because of these tools. And so I think competition and tournament, that yardstick tournament among local governments and local government officials' incentives, which is something that is something, again, very different from other mayors around the world, whether it's promotion or whether it's personal gains or cronyism, there was an incentive to promote um, economic performance. And they often pick the, the better companies, the private enterprises. I think recent data have shown that the ones that are closest in the firm network to uh, uh, government, uh, um, to the go local SOEs or central SOEs are actually the more productive ones. They have uh, the incentive to pick the more productive rather than the less productive uh, to be able, to, or else they, the, the most productive would just flee to a neighboring province and add and contribute to their uh, GDP instead. Um, and also one, one potential um, benefit of that, uh, at least insofar as the last 40 years, is that you can do experimentation, right, to avoid large-scale instability or failure. Um, and if some of them were not successful, they could just be discontinued and have no major impact. And so I think in summary, there's a very unique balance between, in, as, insofar as China's model, between industry and government coordination and market mechanisms, and potentially I'd add individualism and communalism that is, uh, that is um, uh, quite, quite unprecedented. And of course, this leads to a complex landscape of central and local relationships. And I want to bring this up this point because I think this is the very, at the very heart of today's issue. Uh, we've seen huge amounts of you know, local government debt uh, contributing to the overall national debt, and this kind of complex and um, uh, uh, this tension between local and central governments, or the dilemma, if you will, um, has actually existed since, since history. Uh, but uh, on the one hand, uh, the central government would like to have a very vertical system to strengthen central control management and monitoring of local government, which again has been one of the challenges uh, when you decentralize too much. On the other hand, you want to have give a little bit more autonomy to the provincial governments uh, in order for them to have the power to manage their sub-level uh, governments, but also to give more autonomy to implement reforms and deliver economic growth. At the end of the day, it's the local governments who have to carry out these economic uh, 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 objectives. Um, sometimes they would use counter exchanges to break local protectionism. You know, local protectionism is a very uh, important challenge uh, today. Uh, first of all, you know, because uh, in the past 40 years, uh, when you had very quantifiable uh, and uh, visible uh, uh, metric to measure a local government's performance, like GDP growth, it was kind of easier, let's say, on some on one hand, uh, to, to select um, uh, uh, and incentivize the local government. But then the local government really tried to borrow and tried to you know, undertake these you know, huge fiscal expenditures, and that often led to a huge amount of um, overcapacity. Now we've seen overcapacity in steel, cement, and real estate. Again, it has a lot to do with the political economy nature of this. Now we wouldn't really discuss this in the canonical economic models, right? There would be economic factors, but I think the political economy and uh, factor in that model is precisely one of the underpinning kind of factors that's driving this huge uh, buildup of debt and this you know, current dilemma of how much responsibility you want to give to the local governments and how much expenditure and borrowing and financial undertaking that they should assume. That kind of tension is very much playing out today. So this fiscal revenue sharing, when we talk about the needed fiscal reforms today, 
that very much encapsulates that central local dilemma, which I think is going to be a recurring theme. But it's that these rich policy tools that provide more options for adjustment of the Ch China's central local relationship. But that tension has um, been always uh, kind of existing in history and, and manifest in different ways and uh, shape. Um, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, and another, another aspect of the local government uh, or mayor economy is that there is substantial heterogeneity among the local governments. Even today, if we look at the debt issue, right, there are lots of cities that are not indebted at all. They're totally fine, uh, whereas other, some other local governments are heavily indebted and potentially even not able to resolve some of these issues going forward. Um, one of the things that uh, we found uh, kind of just out of curiosity, you know, there's this, this, this notion in China is that, you know, there are two qualities of the government, whether you're a qin, which is kind of like friendly and you, you offer good government care and services and low tax burden or uh, uh, explicit or implicit tax burdens, and qin, which is uh, clean, integrity, and transparency. Um, and so we found indexes that measured these, these degrees of qin and qing across the city level municipal governments and just, you know, casually plotting them uh, and seeing if there's a relationship. And it seems like if you're both qing and qin, which is clean and friendly, uh, you get, um, uh, and the, the size of the circle is, is uh, uh, the, the kind of the overall uh, industrial manufacturing uh, kind of value added, uh, you get bitter, bigger, and more successful companies. And then, you know, if you're on the Qing index, it's better to be clean rather than just being friendly. But what also is, was interesting is that we, we suspected that a lot of it has to do with the prevalence of resources um, in, um, in, that, in that city. And so it's actually the resource scarce cities that actually pushed more for technology. I mean, think about Shenzhen, right? Shenzhen is the, 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 the example here, the prime example here. Oops, um, uh, anyway, on the top, um, really basically a place that had no, no resources as opposed to the, some of the northeastern uh, provinces. And it's that resource scarcity can associate with this, the, the, the curse of resources, but here we're talking about China, so it's at the local government level. Um, it's the, the ones that have more scarce resources that actually did much better. And maybe they have uh, more of an um, a incentive to push for technology firms and manufacturing companies rather than kind of derive fiscal revenues from uh, commodities. So there is a little bit of relationship there in terms of uh, scarce. And it's going to be very hard to read this, uh, this map, uh, but let me just explain this to you. This is the share of revenue that's coming from land sales on the left, and this is the resource abundance of the, of the city distribution. And basically they're complementary. So basically when you have a, um, or at least when we plot it, uh, when we do a regression, it's the resource uh, scarce uh, provinces or cities that, um, that actually derive more uh, uh, revenues from real estate. But, you know, again, real estate, manufacturing ind industries, they're all in kind of, um, uh, uh, they're, they're all basically the same thing because you have more industries, you get a higher real estate price, et cetera. And so there are some more things to uncover, but again, just to uh, emphasize that there's a lot of heterogeneity even at the local government level, and a lot of that is driving some of these, uh, the problems, economic problems today. Um, so, you know, in answering the question of whether this model is still very, you know, to, just to summarize, the power of this model is the state mobilization, state coordination, state allocation, plus the very decentralized mayor economy with incentives. And, you know, they're very close to the ground. They're sensitive to market reactions. They can foster these mini Silicon Valleys all around the country by not just financial subsidies. The point is it wasn't just financial subsidies, but it was helping them coordinate financing from local banks, which was so critically important because China's financial system being so weak meant that a lot of these companies could not have easy financing. But it was also about talent attraction. It was also about reducing the burdens of um, entry, entry barriers, et cetera. That was the strength of that model. But the downside, some of which I've mentioned, the overcapacity, I mean, even just think about it today, um, and I'll show you some numbers about it, the overcapacity of potentially EVs, right? Again, these local governments have an incentive to push for these companies to survive, to, sorry, to thrive. And um, uh, data has shown that, you know, at the end of the tenure, right about when you're about to be promoted, so about the fourth or fifth year of the term in the local catters, you're seeing the, the more over, oversupply problem 
overcapacity problem uh, in, these, in these companies. And so you'd give these companies free land or cheap land, and then these companies would actually use this cheap land to borrow even more. Right? So there was an, a reckless expansion of financing, really, really low cost of capital. I mean, think about it. It's, it's, a, it's a problem because um, for a long period of time, the Chinese people saved a lot, but their return on capital was extremely low. And in some ways, households were subsidizing for the low cost of capital for production. And that's, that's why that's one of the reasons we got all of this overcapacity issues and you know, also China becoming a manufacturing of the world. Um, but a lot of it is also driven and encouraged by the local governments leading to reckless kind of uh, behavior. Now, I should say that that improved over time, but that was kind of the prevailing model at that time. Um, and uh, there was, of course, you know, huge misallocation of resources and investment inefficiency, and uh, there was a crowding out of potentially private firms as well. So looking today, you know, do we need that many local government officials? Do they need to have that much responsibility? Should the market play a bigger role is, is the key question. So um, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I wanted to mention this, which is that uh, when you know everything was focused on growth and that was a national priority, it was easier for the local government decentralized model to work because it was quantifiable, it was observable to a certain extent. It wasn't a perfect metric, but uh, you know it encouraged uh, these local mayors uh, to, uh, to to deliver growth, and that's exactly what happened. But when you expand across um, a, a different objectives or change the objective functions to include things like financial stability, but also now more social issues like like uh, stability during the pandemic, it was it was about pandemic controls. A lot of these new measures are potentially antithetical to growth. So when there are some conflicting goals, that's when the local economy model, local government model, actually meets its challenges. Um, because you know many of them would say, well, for the interest of pandemic, let's sacrifice growth, or for the interest of environmental protection, let's sacrifice growth. And I think this is part of the reason that we're seeing also. Um, a slow a growth because the incentives, incentive structure has also changed. You can say some of it is also beyond economic factors, being political loyalty, and when you, when, when you have a whole slew of, of objectives, it's going to be very difficult to, 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 to kind of to push for um, very um, solid economic uh, performance. So I'll skip through these. Um, so the new era, I'd say that in the new era, if the last few decades were defined by industrialization and manufacturing and the real estate boom and really transitioning from the path from Im imitator to innovator, then the next economic phase is going to be dominated by who controls the best technologies and the going abroad of Chinese technology companies. And so you want to ask the question of what that, whether that local government model is still suited for that new era because, you know, of course, to have sustainable growth in the future for China is not, not longer going to just be about industrialization and real estate. It has to be about um, innovation and technology. Now, we were talking about this earlier, but it's, it is ironic that four out of the five of the most downloaded apps in the U.S. today are Chinese. Okay, that's that's a very um, that's a that's that's kind of one of the the very stark examples of this going abroad, uh, globally successful uh, Chinese model. Um, behind uh, basically the two trailblazers of the EV industry is Tesla and BYD, and BYD actually has the number one share of global sales. And um, it's also ironic that today, or a few years ago, or recently, um, I was told that Toyota bought a BYD EV car and broke it down completely just to see why it was so good. And 15 years ago, it was Chinese doing that. So a lot of things have, have changed, and that's kind of the new era. Ten largest economy uh, companies, internet companies by revenue, dominated by US and American, uh, sorry, American Chinese firms. If you look at the largest 25 internet companies, by market cap, uh, I think nine are Chinese, 11 are, 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 are US companies. Um, uh, I'm going to skip through these, and Huawei is also, you know, still has a quarter of uh, the world's 5G uh, share. And so, uh, in facing with international competition, you know, the point is that these globally successful players are private companies. They're not SOEs. They're the ones that have been really su uh, successful because of the competitiveness of the domestic market. Again, the market uh, is important. And so I just want to talk about this uh, technology innovation model. 
um, there's been an evolution of the different models or the different approaches to this whole Venetian program when it comes to science and technology. It started with a, two bombs and one satellite, Liang kind of program in the 50s and 70s, really dominated by just government. The government was uh, pretty much uh, doing everything. Um, it was um, uh, basically undertaking all the activities, including uh, research. Um, and that kind of morphed into uh, slightly more participation of the market. And then the big chip fund, sorry, the, chi uh, the big chip fund uh, uh, since 2014 uh, had um, saw you know limited success compared to the size of um, the um, the kind of um, the, the 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 programs, uh, and in that chip fund they wanted to build up capacity very quickly of a, a sector that China was falling or it was uh, was a follower fast follower so they leveraged social capital including the participation of venture funds, <coughs> but the problem they they saw was that they could not oversee directly how these companies were spending these funds and they didn't achieve the expected results, so that kind of change into a little bit more plan again by 2018, the science and technology reform mode, and, uh, uh, and centralized a little bit more of that control. Um, but now the new national system, all this is you know, being iterated uh, multiple times. They're learning, and it's, I think it's getting smarter. A lot of these local governments first directly invested in these companies, and they said, well, what do we know about these companies? We don't have any expertise. So then they partner up with asset funds and venture funds and private equity groups and let them pick the potential winners. Again, it's not about picking national champions. It's about enabling lots and lots of companies with potential and letting the market decide who are going to be the ultimate um, uh, uh, winners and, uh, um, uh, of, that, of that race. And so the participation of these venture funds that had expertise uh, was, you know, uh, uh, came in, and that was a little bit more successful. So I think now there's a rethinking, um, but the element of state is still very, very important in their thinking today. The element that they, that at least in terms of leadership's thinking, they don't believe that just the market is sufficient to deliver these um, these uh, successful companies. But there has to be more of an element of the market playing a much bigger role, but there is still a central role to be emphasized, at least that is the, the current uh, thinking. Um, so very lastly, let me just tell you about the constraints of that local government model. The first is there's gonna be weakening, weakening of the mayor economy due to the fiscal constraints. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you can't read all this, but basically the local government itself has 100 trillion RMB of debt. Um, and the, the, this is the, the, the reliance of land sales as a percentage of local government revenue has significantly fallen um, because of the real estate crackdown. And a lot of this debt is obviously a uh, hidden debt. So that will be uh, constrained. Now, um, the question is, is renewables going to be the real estate, right? They're doing some, some of the very similar things. Look at this municipal investment platform. This is kind of like the local government financing vehicles that were, you know, that were used to, to invest in real estate. Now they're doing it with renewables. Just in 2023, these were set up uh, uh, to do that. Um, so, um, real, but the problem is that real estate sales in 2022 was 13.5 trillion RMB. And fiscal revenue from land use rights alone amounted to 5.32 trillion RMB, but new energy transport is significantly smaller, right? 6.9 trillion RMB with fiscal revenue derived 900 billion RMB. So these things are not really comparable. There are some other estimates that suggest that in the future, renewable investment will amount to 10 trillion RMB, just like real estate. Uh, uh, but that's on the op optimistic side. And the question is, you know, the thing we need to watch is that is renewables going to be the real estate in the same sense of having a bubble and overcapacity? So, for instance, sales of new energy vehicles increased uh, by 419 percent between 2020 and 2022. But the global demand of EVs is estimated to be 26.3 million in 2025, which is significantly smaller than China's supply of 36.6 million. And the same thing goes for batteries. So that is, um, again, there's a local government has, has now need to derive revenues not from real estate but something else, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, so is it suitable for the new era? Overcapacity ultimately hurts the companies, at least to reduce uh, monopoly. As we all know from economic basic economic theory, you need some monopoly rents to encourage innovation, so you can't have too much competition. 
and these you know EV companies or solar panels backed by different municipal governments um, can lead to that kind of uh, overcapacity uh, problem. And um, if we you know look at the financial system, when 80% of aggregate social credit is still derived from banks, and only 10% coming from direct capital markets like uh, 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 equity and debt. Um, uh, or bonds, then then uh, that's a problem because you still need to rely on local governments to uh, uh, arrange that kind of uh, financing. So financial system reform is critically important. Um, and the local bre breakdown, the local government model, again, with the shifting priorities, a little bit away from economy to security, a little bit away from economic performance to political loyalty and to things like environmental protection and all that also uh, means that there's a little bit of weakening for the new era. And then, of course, there's a public debt overhang because then going forward, governments are going to try to raise local taxes uh, and they could be uh, cutting back their expenditures on critical infrastructure. They can have distorted behavior and shift more away from long-term sustainable growth to short-term uh, oriented, potentially even extort extortionary. And of course, we need to think about the local small, medium-sized banks, which are in financial distress. It will be they who will be, it will be them absorbing a lot of the local government debt. So I think there, this model is going to be anyways weakening uh, for a variety of reasons. And, um, and here is just uh, to show how important the financial system is. If you look on the left-hand side, this is the Chinese PE funds uh, fundraising market. In 2017, $190 billion. And in 2022, fell to 33.3. And in Q2 of this year, $9.9 billion. On the right-hand side, 2020, November 3rd, Apple was equivalent to basically four Chinese companies, minus some. And th three years later, Apple is equivalent to, I don't know how many that is, but 30 uh, Chinese companies in valuation uh, plus some. So, you know, if you're thinking about innovation, if you're thinking about technology, uh, one of the reasons why U.S. has such a successful ecosystem, I think, goes back to the, the, the hyperactivity in the financial system, the depth, the liquidity, the fact that there's lots of mergers and acquisitions, the fact that financing com, com, comes easily, and all of that is missing in, in China. Um, but that said, markets are playing a big role. Despite everything we're hearing, the private sector, whether it's in terms of tax revenue share or asset scale or the employment of, uh, of, of jobs accounted for, industrial revenue, trade um, volume, but also innovation, which I don't have, it's primarily driven by the private sector, uh, not by the state. So that's contrary to what, uh, what we think. And lastly, there's a new generation, which I won't talk about. So that concludes the talk with the new era as China moves from smokestack industries to high tech and innovation, uh, from GDP growth to a broader metric of development <coughs> and more sustainable growth. And lastly, most importantly, China is becoming an increasingly complex society. And how to manage that where material sufficiency is no longer just enough to keep, uh, keep people uh, 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 content uh, uh, along with the middle income trap, demographic challenge, and also, of course, the external geopolitical uh, challenges will be very important uh, in, in shaping China's economic future for some time to come. Thank you very much. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, I, sh I should emphasize this is, this is only 10% I think you covered in, in, in the content in the book. So I highly recommend everyone to, to take a copy and, and read uh, uh, sort of the very comprehensive coverage of, of chi the Chinese economy. Um, I want to start off maybe with a few questions uh, to, to you uh, re related to, 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 to the talk. And going back to the, the mayor economy uh, uh, point that you made earlier, uh, it, it was one, one part I think sort of potentially is very underappreciated when we think about sort of the RNS and Chinese economy is that the French government, for example, 70% um, the of, the, of, the, of the fiscal spending happening at the federal level. For the US, 55% of, of the government spending happening at the federal level. And for China, only 20% of the fiscal spending happening at the federal level. So really, this is one of the most decentralized system that, that we know, and then very much sort of with this is underpinning of the, of the mayor economy. What, what I, I want to sort of see your opinion on is, um, you mentioned a few examples, EV battery, which is the classic example of thinking about sort of Ningde, thinking about sort of uh, the, the example of, of, uh, of a, a local government taking charge of the local firm and because of the yardstick competition and really push the firm to the, to the frontier. 
uh, and that really sort of uh, uh, showcase sort of the, the, the pretty ingenious design of this of this decentralized system combining competition, political competition at the local level and a lot of decentralized local resources. I, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about, I guess, two versions of the question. Shouldn't we see more of the local success stories than the one we currently see if every single local government is doing this level of competition, have this much control over local resources? Shouldn't every single local city has their flagship companies that really become the, the world-class uh, story? And on the flip side, do we learn from the failed examples where companies didn't go further, local governments with all the right incentive but didn't have the right uh, firm uh, being pushed out uh, to be the success? Do that, what does that tell us about the, the, the mayor economy or the, the, I guess maybe the word, the limit of, 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 the, of, the, of the system is? Great, thank you, David. Um, these are excellent questions. Uh, first of all, you know, I hope the first map show you the distribution of unicorns. If unicorns is already a, a sign of success, it's at least ge geographically dispersed. Now, I think there, are, you know, the process is a little bit different. Sometimes you can say that once they've become successful, these local governments will bid for a company with great promise, and it will be a little bit like a beauty pageant, and um, uh, and that's the case with Neo and 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 so on. So they have to s show some potential. Uh, you have to show some promise. Now, it's not like in the case of the U.S., where you have to be really really ultra successful, like Amazon and. And, and Tesla and SpaceX to get these subsidies, but you have to show some, some, uh, some, some potential. So there's a recent headquarter uh, uh, kind of model where if you move your headquarters to that, that, uh, that, that city, then you get uh, extra benefits. So it's not as if it's always, you know, local government fostered it, but certainly at later stage, and these governments could be playing like um, late stage financing role uh, that they will, that will support you until you really, really make it. Um, so it, there's a little bit of, the, of that going on. Um, I think it's a very interesting to test um, comparing to other companies, identical company, otherwise identical companies, uh, what happens if they don't um, have that kind of local government uh, uh, support. Um, but I'd say that uh, if you talk to just broadly to the, a lot of these companies, uh, they're often in search of local governments to back them up. And this is, you know, whether they understand their business, our strategic long-term thinking, and also ability to help them get financing. So again, it's a little bit like a, like a beauty pageant. Um, but from the solar case, you've seen, you know, the arrival of these different policies at different cities have produced heterogeneous results, but they're all, you know, they're all pretty successful. So that, that goes to show that some of these policies really do work. Uh, in different stages of the development. If you were to pick uh, one <coughs> single sort of, I guess, uh, case where the system break down, w w which one would you, would, you, would you pick? And what, what does this oh. tell us about how? Yeah, I think, look, the c traditional combustion engine uh, cars, you know, that was not really that successful. And Cherry was supported by one government, and there was, you know, Wuhu government supported another. And that local protectionism actually um, prevented these companies from, from successful, being successful because they'd say, look, your cars, we can't use you. We're going to use our own cars in our city um, because you know, we're, su we're supporting those cars. So that kind of local protectionism, I think, is a very uh, potentially very inefficient and actually trying to reduce competition rather than increase competition. So the traditional combustion, but you know, there are other factors behind it, right? You know, just trying to, trying to can't do this technology very well. So again, it's not as if the local government can do everything. It's that once you show some promise, they could potentially um, uh, foster a more uh, uh, hospitable environment for you to succeed. But I really do think that financing is a major part of that story. And again, that comes back to the weakness and the immaturity of the financial system. If you, they can go to the capital markets uh, to raise finance, you don't have to be so dependent on local governments. But for a lot of these chip companies we're talking about today, everybody's searching for a local government to back them up, again, to overcome that barrier. Right, and then, and as you sort of alert to in the end, this is gonna become increasingly difficult as, as, as local governments is being the financier of this, and local governments is, is quickly running out of, out of cash in many yeah. ways. Four trillion RMB spent on PCR testing in the last three years. <coughs> I guess so. Let me let me switch to a, a, a slightly different topic, but very related topic. You, there's one very intriguing set of themes that you you mentioned throughout the book, and some show up in, in your in your talk today, which is that the Chinese government is hyper incentivized to sustain the growth of the economy, 
to make sure that massive uh, a, a crisis don't occur and has the means and the political will to do so. It creates this byproduct of a, system, a, a economy <coughs> that has not experienced a lot of failure and has, has generated both from the micro level, you, you see the generations that potentially experience a lot of pessimism today where the economy is slowly down, slowing down because people have not gone through a, a, a period where with the economy slowed down. Business may not have gone through a, a well-functioning bankruptcy procedure uh, uh, that gives the entire system-wide sort of resilience. Uh, do you think part of the sort of the how do you assess sort of the resilience level of the of the economy? Do you, in what time, in what situation, some crisis let it let it burst is actually good for the long run health of the of the of the of the economy versus this is a, a disease that needs to be solved uh, or cured because because the it's, you know, you're going to kill the, the economy in the short run before waiting for the long run. Mm. Well, first of all, Schumpeterian creative destruction, right? Mm. Very central to you know how the market's functioning. You oust the least productive, and you have you know you give more opportunities and offer more resources to the more productive, and that was really absent. And again, if you look at the exa rate, first of all, we had a, the predominance of SOEs in China, and their exa mechanisms are very different. <coughs> You're not allowed to exit, you know, and, you, and because you had employment, uh, so it's very different from the private sector where exa mechanisms were were more market driven. But even if you look at the stock market, and one of the factors that have made China's stock market perform so badly, um, at least compared to its phenomenal growth, is that the exit, the delisting of companies that were not performing well was also extremely, it was very low, it was like 1% per year, compared to even much lower than India, Brazil, and America, of course. And so, and, and also once, um, when the economy is always booming, you know, you're always gonna make money, you're never gonna be ousted. And, you know, the fact that there were no crises, we saw how in, in the, even in Western countries, how lots of these crises led to readjustments and uh, reallocation of resources and so forth. And that was totally absent in a country that was very, very well managed, but using these government tools to prevent crises. The one thing Chinese government didn't like was, was volatility. It's not that you know you want to just inflate all the numbers. They didn't like volatility, so they tried to make inflation smooth, GDP smooth, and so on. Uh, and that 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 that's the tension between paternalism and the inability to let go. I think is behind a lot of these the the financial puzzles. You know, same thing with protecting the the investors. So first of all, retail investors account for most of the turnover in the stock markets, and the government wants to protect these retail investors. But the more you protect them, the less they learn. The less they learn, you're always going to have to protect them more and intervene more. You can't get out of that that cycle. So these they, they, these companies or people don't learn. And even today with the real estate, you know, yes, they wanted to teach a lesson to the developers and all of that. But then, you know, they're afraid. Of, so they're afraid of moral hazard. But now they. It seems like they need to, they, they may be overdone it to the point of, uh, detrimental point of potentially killing the, the real estate sector and so on. So that, that inability to let go, and while you want to be a market economy and you want to be a globally, you know, global financial center, but inability to let go and to, to let these people learn um, update is, is, I think, is, is, is a problem. Is a real problem, but the point is to uh, uh, avoid these systemic, huge financial crises that lots of emerging countries have seen, and then which then subsequently fell into this middle income trap. A lot of is spurred by a huge financial crisis. I think that is important to avoid. I guess the, it's a, a delicate balance between political security, <coughs> political stability on one hand, but also building in some resilience to volatility as you mentioned yeah. in, the, in the system. And it seems like navigating out of this growth era in the next decade or so, um, moving, shifting the resources or shifting the incentives for, for the people to embrace volatility, embrace mm -hmm. some of the resilience building, yeah. uh, is something that I, I guess I haven't seen much of the political discussion about. It's still sort of trying to maintain uh, yeah. Lack of crisis. Well, some of the, the discussions about lower but higher quality growth, yeah. I think, is a little bit of a psychological, you know, normalization trying to tell people, look, you know, let's tolerate slow growth if it's higher quality. Yeah. But in a, in a substance, I think there not, needs to be more done. Great. All right. Enough of me talking. Let me let me open up uh, uh, the the discussion to the to the floor. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, 来。
Uh, let me take sort of uh, try to do this. Uh, take two questions uh, in a, in a group, and then uh, so that we can answer them a bit more efficiently. Good. Uh, My name is Bill Xiao. I'm an economist, but a retired professor here. Uh, I have a question, which is uh, starting from your beginning, that uh, China's new playbook is. Uh, uh, political centralization, but uh, uh, economic decentralization. Well, when you have political centralization, they're going to, as you point out, they use that power to allocate, mobilize and allocate resources, and resources including financial and uh, human resources, I'm sure. Well, can you elaborate for us what are the uh, contradictions made based on political considerations or misjudgment or limiting information? That's a criticism of an autocratic government in economic terms versus that model can also enhance the market mechanism, because it's two-sided story. Can you elaborate the advantage of have this centralized political that controls resources allocation, including bank loans, right, interest rates, versus then you decentralize the market, the market depends on that macro policy. Thanks. Let's, let's take one more question. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Hi, Koei. Welcome back to Harvard. Uh, my name is Xi Xuan. I'm coming from Harvard Chinese School, and I was working as private equity in China. And my question is, as you mentioned, uh, there are like growing number of the local government they are trying to uh, take part in the private equity investment. But the fact I actually said, uh, saw is that those kind of uh, like SOE controlled or SOE related GP, uh, compared with the uh, like normally the uh, USD fund we know, they have like uh, probably like less uh, expertise and uh, like generally speaking they cannot like uh, source or find the uh, as good company as uh, the USD fund. And we select the retreat of all the USD fund and like growing number of the uh, investment activity by those kind of uh, SOE or state related private equity. <coughs> I personally am very concerned that after five to six years, where those kind of money need to be uh, paid off, it's very hard for them to have the like enough uh, payoff compared with the other private equity. So I was like uh, wondering, like, what do you see about this activity, and do you have any suggestion in helping all those kind of systems become more effective in the investment uh, activity? Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so contradiction. Um, I think that this, why I think this political centralization plus economic decentralization is unique and that political centralization element is very important is actually a fascinating study done to compare Soviet Union's model and, and China's model. Actually, the Soviet Union had um, a, a very decentralized economic model, but without the political centralization to be able to control and monitor the local, what happens on the ground. And what happened was, again, I'm not an expert on this, but this is just what I read, is that um, there was a lot of extortionary behavior at the local level, and it did not lead to the kind of successes that we saw in China, the economic successes, because of that lack of political power at the very top to strengthen that that, that model, and that's the unique element, is that you need to be able to monitor, control, and manage the local sub-governments to a certain extent. It's never going to be perfect, right? Hence, all the problems with the local debt, as we've seen. Um, but without the political centralization, at least in the case of Soviet Union, it was also um, a failure. Um, you know, as I think about the new era, I don't think that, you know, there was a time and place for that, that model. And there was a time and place for that, the importance of state coordination and mobilization, allocation. You can argue that it's still important for emerging sectors, emerging new technologies. The, you know, the fact that Chinese government ruled out four million charging, EV charging stations around the country is useful. The fact that they coordinated supply chains and enacted systematic wide changes is something that pretty, pretty much no other government can do. 
you can argue that that's still kind of important for emerging technologies. But I think we can't overestimate that anymore. We can't um, put too much on emphasis. In China, in the beginning of stages of development, there were no markets to, to, to speak of. Right? So the state playing that role to quickly organize everything, coordinate everything, to, to build this enormous network of productivity, whether it's through infrastructure or through the, all these things, was, um, was important. And even you know, looking back at e economic historians, Gershon Krau, Nersk, and these economists have emphasized that, that state role, but again, in the beginning stages of development. And now you talk about China, where the, the biggest players are still the private companies, um, going forth and charging over the overseas, uh, it feels like the market needs to play a, a more important role. And I, I think the quicker you can, you can, you can um, transition into that. But again, that requires uh, the requisite condition is the reform of the financial system so that they can be less dependent on local governments. The more successful uh, it will be at this stage of development. And then um, uh, with regard to private equity and local government, I mean, I think it's. Um, Again, there's no systematic studies on this, and I think it would be something really interesting to do. Uh, the, the, the new model is for the, the local governments to leverage social capital. So if they're in, even with a very small commitment, uh, it's at, le at least believed that you have the local government backing that you can attract some other uh, big funds uh, with understanding it's not for the financial investment, but for the fact that local governments can solve a lot of your daily problems, and that's really important in a country with a lot of um, administrative barriers. Um, so not for their money, not for their expertise, but also the fact that they can leverage social capital. I've also heard of stories where they are becoming much smarter over time, and it would differ from government to government, and they've learned from their past mistakes, and a lot of them are not s trying to maximize their financial economic returns. Uh, Hefei's government is, a, is an exception. They made a lot of money backing some of these, these companies. But the point is, once you get that industrial uh, 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 kind of cluster going, it's going to contribute to their real estate, their fiscal revenues, their jobs, and it's a, it's a virtuous circle for them. So the point I didn't, try to, I didn't finish making about the renewables is the real estate sector was a closed circle, loop circle. And same thing with renewables. You want to subsidize or have some kind of uh, promotion policies for the companies. And then um, in the EVs, they then subsidize the consumers on the demand side. And all of that you know, was a closed circle loop. And that led to more resources for the fiscal revenues for the government and real estate and so forth. So it's not about individual financial returns per se. But I think the fact that they don't put too much emphasis on that is a problem as well, right? They're probably, look at the big chip fund. They're just spreading all this money around without the expected results. So it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Great. I think we'll have time for a few more. Hi, uh, Professor, thank you so much for coming here today. I am Su Wu. I'm a PhD candidate at Boston University in Political Science. And I'm interested in, since you spent a lot of time talking about resource uh, distribution and uh, the relationship between that and the local government, I was wondering if you have thought about um, this relationship from the perspective of soft power, such as like everyday norms or um, ideological, culturally, how are local governments uh, influencing the economy? I'm just really interested in that. Thank you so much. I'll take one more from that side of the room. Let's, let's finish this side and then we'll, we'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my name is Yun Zhu. I'm a master's student at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, my question is about the relationship between uh, government and the market uh, in the new era, uh, particularly in the innovation system. So as you mentioned in the talk, uh, in the US system, we see a highly sort of uh, functioning private financial market as well as a booming you know, startup sector that has uh, you know, stimulated a lot of innovation and growth. Uh, in the Chinese system, uh, it seems like the, the government can be relying on both SOEs and also the private uh, startups to do those things. We see the recent development of Huawei's you know, new chips, which is coming from joint collaboration from you know, High Silicon as well as the SMIC, which is like a state-owned uh, you know, uh, government fund. And in fact, if you look at back you know, the innovations that China has done. It's mostly a combination of industrial policies as well as, you know, private entrepreneurship. 
So I, I was wondering, uh, do you think uh, this trend of collaboration between SOEs and uh, the private uh, startups, will it you know, continue in the future? Do you think it represents a new kind of different kinds of innovation system from the US system going forward? Thank you. Okay. Um. Well, soft power is, is the, the key question of the day. You know, China does hard power pretty well, or at least until recently. Now the hard power is also uh, in trouble because it's economic situation. So um, I don't know if the local government plays a very big role in the, the kind of cultural community kind of uh, soft power aspects. I mean, that's a very, very interesting question. I, I guess I focus on the economic issues without delving in. Um, for them, of course, it's it's a lot about social stability, right? Um, and the first consideration is unemployment rates, youth unemployment rates, uh, and things like that. Um, I think the local governments do attempt to do at least in terms of you know providing green green space or parks. I think it's implemented by these local governments. So you know, fostering a generally uh, uh, stable, uh, harmonious society is definitely part of the, the you know, the really important uh, agenda. But I'm not sure uh, how much influence it has on on dictating the overall uh, cultural uh, identity of, of, of the people. Um, on the SOE question, uh, you know, I, my my sense is that it's a very it's a mixed blessing to be involved with SOEs or local governments. You know, sometimes. I think a lot of these companies, when they really need something, and I think in this particular instance, it is really financing or long-term big chunks of money uh, collaborating with the state in one shape or form is beneficial. Uh, not Again, not necessarily direct investment from the government, but the fact there are connections to local banks, uh, commercial banks, because again, remember that all most of the, lo uh, the financing is coming from banks is really, really important. But it's a mixed blessing because there's also a lot of evidence that you know, maybe interventions or not uh, aligned or strategic thinking is a big uh, is a big uh, a barrier to to these um, to the development of the company. So uh, I don't know if it's actually a sustainable model. It's very clear that the majority of the innovation is done by private companies themselves. And as I mentioned, the five different modes of the the, the whole of a nation system, they've initially it was just primarily SOEs doing research, just even research and innovation. And now they're le leveraging the private sector to do that. So I just don't, I don't know whether it's really just about financing or there's really some other added benefits, but I suspect not. I mean, I guess I will quickly add to the, to the last point. I, I do think it's a, it's a myth that you can deprive innovation from government support uh, and China is unique in doing so. I don't think one can think of any major technology breakthrough anywhere in the world in the last sort of five, 50 years where government does not play a, 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 a important role in, 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 a, in a matter. I think the question probably is, is how do you avoid misallocation, how do you avoid mistakes when government enter, rather than sort of you know, how do you do it without the government uh, entering at all. Um, anyways, let's, let's finish the, some of the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for the interesting talk. I'm Aaron Yang, I'm, I'm a visiting scholar at the School of Engineering here. Um, I originally come from Germany, actually. I work in the University of Munich in Germany. I am concerned about a question related to climate change. Um, in your talk, you didn't really talk about carbon things. You know, carbon price, carbon tariff, carbon trade is now kind of a hot topic in, in this uh, uh, climate change context. I just want to simply ask your opinion about how the carbon issues would affect economic development in China, and for instance, how to uh, how, how would it affect this uh, <coughs> trade, international trade between China and other countries, and the entire economic performance, and your opinion about the, the current status and the future trends. And thank you. Pass the mic to the. Hi, uh, I have a question regarding the financing for the private sector. Do you want to uh, identify, identify yourself? Oh, um, I'm Harry Wong. I'm the second year master's of public administration students at Harvard Kennedy School. 
So I have a question regarding the financing for the private sector. Uh, we have this long the state strikes back argument that they're reversing the financing for the private sector, and then right now the decline in venture capital and private equity funds. Now for the past year, we can see a lot of uh, arguments from the Chinese government regarding the emphasis on the uh, private sector developments, but I am still very unclear. In this new era, uh, are there uh, enough uh, capability at the, very, uh, at the very beginning, and also the willingness for both the central government and the local government to finance uh, private sector and also uh, to promote mm -hmm. the private sector growth and innovations that you have mentioned. So I would like to uh, hear from you, uh, Dr. Uh, Jin, Professor Jing, about this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, carbon, obviously, climate change, very important. I, if there was one point I wanted to drive across uh, in this talk is that I think for the majority of economic issues, we cannot think, it, think about it independently of the local government political economy model. And that includes um, things like environmental protection or green tech or, or the carbon challenge. And um, again, this is not my field of uh, expertise or my research area, but from what I've read, uh, again, there's this dilemma, right? On the one hand, uh, the local governments still want to, uh, uh, they, they still need to um, uh, uh, deliver economic performance and growth, so they still have an emphasis on growth because that's the jobs, that's the fiscal revenue, especially nowadays uh, with the decline of the real estate. Um, and from the past, we've seen studies where, again, that's become a contradiction. So, in fact, the central government, in terms of reducing pollution, has set that target very, very early on, um, early 2000s, um, or even potentially before. But you, could, you saw repeatedly that there was very little improvement on the local government at the local level um, for over a stretch of 15 years. And uh, the studies show that, again, that was, there were some unintended consequences, right? It was very difficult to meet these targets because they were focused on growth or they were, uh, for instance, in terms of water pollution, uh, they were trying to do this beggar thy neighbor effect of polluting downstream and then becoming much more lax on the downstream producers and companies uh, in order for them to be, you know, to meet the targets upstream. So there was a lot of, again, kind of uh, unintended consequences coming from this dilemma of local government response. And even going forward, you know, despite the, the commitment to carbon neutrality and all of that, I think it's still going to be a very a kind of a, a, a wavering process where the emphasis will still be on development and growth and then employment and then on the other hand trying to fulfill that 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 kind of uh, uh, um, that target and it will be back and forth. It will be it will be a struggle between you know how to use coal or clean coal and then filling the and then not letting it hurt growth too much. So that kind of balancing objective will be a challenge going over. But again, we have to come down to what happens at the local level and what are their incentives to really understand and predict what will likely be the situation uh, in China. Um, and then with regard to the private sector, I think there is, um, at least in Western headlines media, there is this narrative that somehow the state is controlling the government, uh, sorry, the uh, controlling the, the country and then um, suppressing the private entrepreneurs and the <coughs> private sector. And um, if you just read the surface numbers when you talk about financing, that is true, right? That is true. However, that's not the intention. It's the problem of the financial system. If there was one, one graph I didn't show you. Uh, if you look at the whole financial system, on the top there's like 56 uh, financial institutions, and then on a one level below, there's 2,000 financial institutions. That's, that's how the credit transmission happens through them, the loans. And then they have a white list of who they can, invest, uh, they can lend and who they can't, and they're, they're gonna lend to SOEs. Again, not because of what's the, 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 the mandates of the top government, but because they just feel more comfortable um, in terms of you know looking at their incentives to lend to bigger companies, more profitable companies. I mean, the whole point of a financial system is that when companies need money, they can borrow. Not that the companies that don't need money can can borrow a lot at low cost. So that's that's the problem. So I don't. I think it's not necessarily the intention of the top leadership to discriminate against the private, but it's implicit 
um, constraints of the system, and again, I emphasize the finance again, because that is really critical that has made this uh, discrimination possible. But again, if you look at the recent attitude, change and shift in attitude of the central government, it's all supportive of, of the private sector, right? Come out with a slew of encouraging policy. Maybe you say it's not really substantive, uh, or maybe it will have very little impact uh, in substance, but but the attitude has really shifted because again, the majority of employment is done by, undertaken by the private sector, innovation, all these things that actually really need the private sector. And even with this um, mixed ownership reforms in the last few years, that wasn't really that successful. So they're, 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 they're turning away from that model. Again, it's an iterated model, but I, I don't agree with the view that the intention is, is to, to kind of to, to, to push back or hold back the private sector. Thanks. Let me let me abuse my access to the microphone and ask you the final question. Uh, so your book come out in April this year. Uh, I'm assuming you probably written it sort of a uh, month before uh, the when it was published. If you were to do a version two of the book, given the, the what's happening in the past twelve months uh, uh, or six months since your book come out, other chapters you would write differently, or are you going to double down on 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 all the lessons uh, one draw at the at the timestamp twenty twenty two. <laughs> Thank you. I definitely put a lot more emphasis on the problems of the political economy and facing the current challenges and the and the and the issue uh, and the meeting the potential. Uh, I think a lot of the elements are already there. It's just about using that framework, and that's the intention of the book, to be able to deeper to have deeper thinking, more systematic thinking about what is going wrong, apart from what is what has gone right. Awesome. I, I read the book as very cautiously optimistic, uh, actually, uh, if, if that's a fair, <laughs> fair a good word to Right. Please join me in, in thanking uh, uh, Ke Yujin for your time and wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you. you.